without health insurance. There's a cushy rebellion going on there. Hell, they live here. What kind of asshole lives in San Francisco besides a bartender or a hot dog vendor? <laughs> I'm almost comfortable with it. I know the devil I have. Success would probably make me pass out of vomit. The little man in me gets bigger every night at this six-week outing. There is this fantasy studio apartment in my mind with a water fountain of black stout. Drink the process. Drink the depth of caves tended to by monks who probably don't want to be there. A dog and pony show for some jerk and his kids. I ferment a misconception of myself for the entertainment of five people who would not flinch if I was shot the next day. They'd probably even laugh. The promoter will lose money on this. One of the few nights we have a guarantee. I will never play here again. How have these people taken such a great city and turned it into Washington, D.C.? <laughs> we go over the bridge the next night, and it's magic. Oakland is a hoop. 50 kids show up. They know the words. We sell a few records, cover some Midwest losses with the $75. How I'll take it. Call Peter and tell him to buy cheap joints and a microwave pizza. Tonight we live like kings. <laughs> I guess... I'm like a really obscure variety of potato chip that I know people would like if they just tasted it. <laughs> I used to just want attention, but now I think I've grown up. Now I just want to make your lunch a little bit more interesting. <laughs> and I know in my heart of hearts that the little man will never fully be realized because he's eclipsed by a mammoth mood made of ego and wake up mom and fucking notice me now kind of go get an attitude that could probably use some honing and restraint. Woody Allen has another quote. I would never want to belong to any club that would have someone like me as a member. <laughs> this takes us to the Wayne City second of the lecture. I, I won't out now, I'm sorry. In 2002, while sitting in a cafeteria in City Purchase, a stranger in a strange land who had just left Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York, for a place I knew absolutely nothing about besides it was next to New York, a city they talked about in Lights McNeil's Please Kill Me. A guy with funny glasses and a Pluto t-shirt invited me to sit with him and his friend Dean. I was kind of shocked as I had been unsuccessfully trying to sit with folks every day since I got there three months ago. I was like art school kryptonite. <laughs> I was the one and only odd man out of purchase, a place famous for harboring weirdos of all else. At the community college, I was too weird for the normal kids. At Purchase, I was too normal for the weird kids. I was kind of a doofy guy with a modest mouse t-shirt, semi-long hair, and old navy jeans. I was 23, which creeped out most folks. <laughs> I was placed in a dorm room the size of an interrogation chamber with four grown men. <laughs> Sweet guys who meant well, but all snored like chainsaws in the fifth level of hell. <laughs> we were in one room with bunk beds, all four of us. I went from having my own place to living in a scene from the movie Stripes. <laughs> I spent the first three months walking around campus alone, having panic attacks, and digging for change in the library couches to buy cigarettes and penthouse magazines, which I never truly got to enjoy. <laughs> That's why I just ended up giving them up to counter all those guys so they can look at them ironically. My advisor, my advisor, and I'll never forget his name, Dr. Peter Ory, was the equivalent to Steve Merchant's character in Extra as a bumbling agent. I had apparently been misguided about the deadline for class registration. I ended up getting placed in, check this out, advanced women's studies, which surprised me as I had not taken regular women's studies. Hebrew, also a surprise because I failed Spanish three times in a row. And if you suck at Spanish, taking Hebrew is like being a dude that plays the softball team for your local bar and getting placed on the mound against the Yankees and the bottom of the ninth in Game 7 of the World Series. It's a tough language. But it's worth the effort. My... Not for me, honestly. We changed it a years ago. So I don't know. I'll change it. Change it to already with you. My advisor said, and I quote, my wife is Jewish, she'll love it. I have to go to a barbecue now. <laughs> Same purchase. This is the type of magic. Don't send your kids that Bob, don't send Ashley purchase. I know you're thinking about continuing the family thing. Um, I literally almost cried after every class. The thing is, which I didn't realize was that this 
was the thing you did if you already knew the language. You know, at Easy A, my, my, one, my one friend's dad was a rabbi, and apparently his dad thought the whole thing was hilarious and said, I had a snowball's chance of hell. I dropped out after three weeks. Then I dropped out of computer programming class. It was all Russian guys that finished every assignment in one week. I'd be painstakingly dragging myself through assignment one in week three. To make matters worse, Purchase also was guarded by state troopers. It's really weird. One of them arrested me for throwing a broken box fan up a flight of stairs. No one was hurt. And it was a box fan that belonged, I think, to Jimmy Joe Roach that he threw in the garbage that he didn't want. All of this created the perfect storm that led to me dropping out after only one semester. However, I stayed in touch with that guy in the Pluto shirt and all his weird friends. A couple of them introduced me to Bowie and Swans and the birthday party, and irony. <laughs> I honestly did not understand irony when I first got to purchase. Like, they're like, hey, we're gonna have like, a, an office party. I'm like, oh, you guys work in an office? That's cool. <laughs> like, no, we're in an office party. I'm like, wow, what, 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 are there people that do work in offices? Can you party? No, no, it's gonna be cool. I'm like, what is your fucking deal? <laughs> I have worked in an office, and those parties aren't fun. When <laughs> I was 23, I'd been through wars and stuff. Not really. I don't have the balls to do that. And God bless the way you do it. You 99%ers. Um, this, you've seen Batman. This, I, I thought the movie was pro cop, but I think it's anti cop. I don't know what I think about this was, an, this was an integral point in my life where I was either going to stick it out or call it a day and work at a call center for 50 years or jump into the abyss. I needed that fire under my ass, that blessed fire, that healing explosion. Who would have thought that that blessed fire would come from a gig in Buffalo, New York in the fall of 2005 in an attendance of four people consisting of me, my buddy from Rochester and two ravers um, with actual glow sticks. Apparently they didn't get the memo on the recall for that. <laughs> the, sh the show kicked off, was kicked off by a rapper named Hype, an idiosyncratic mountain of a man, spitting gorgeous truth with a shaved head, and Mickey Free, who gave a hilarious impromptu speech prior to setting it off about homophobia in, Midwestern, in a Midwestern sitco. Um, Apparently the cashier uh, said, uh, like, thought he was gay, he was making some disgruntled remarks, and then Nicky went out to pay for a sandwich and went, by the way, I'm a faggot. <laughs> um, these guys were on fire. Now, um, prior to this, prior to this, I had only seen Sting and R.E.M. concert. <laughs> this was a slight change of guard. I didn't know that this could be a show, and I thought that that was brilliant. Then, then, Dan came up, armed with only a CD player and a couple of pedals which ended up breaking, leading to the quote, one of my favorite quotes of all time, sorry everyone, I'm literally just singing along to a CD player at this point, this is worse than karaoke. <laughs> he, he jubilantly, he jubilantly, 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 he jubilantly, I'm not a bottle brain. He jubilantly, you pronounce this very well. He but you know I'm pronouncing her. He drew me with the jaw. He drew me with the flea. Broke to lying with a shark's head. And when he got to the part about the restaurant being entirely made of peace, I was already sold. I wanted to go to the place where this was emanating from. Here was a guy playing for two disgruntled ravers, walking out with ten dollars to his name, and performing as if he was at Shea Stadium sold out. He even ran outside in the middle of the song onto the street and kept singing, and when he returned, everyone was singing along. I couldn't believe it. Even the rave dogs who, you know, like were being disgruntled were like singing along and like pumped. He broke the back of upstate New York defeatism. I knew right then and there that I was moving to Baltimore and I would do everything in my power to get into this thing called Wham City. After the show, I asked the crew if they wanted to eat at a diner around the corner. Uh, Dan had a handful of quarters to his name and was, you know, kind of reluctant. I said, hey man, I got it. He said, I'll get you back someday, I promise. Well, 10 years and 1,000 free lunches later, I can't imagine life without the guy. I'm going to pay you back, too. I'm pay you back. So who is this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm pretty certain I'm not Sting. But I'm, 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 but I'm also, I've also been around enough to know I'm never going to be French. Like the same thing. I got too much of that knucklehead stepdad in me. Thankfully complimented by the gifts which people like Dan and Dina and Devlin and my girlfriend Cheryl have given me. Patience, stick to of this optimism, consideration for others, and tip your damn barista. So do not fret, my friend, if you find yourself in a world of rotating roommates and ironic porch decor. Turn that frown upside down, get out there, and greet the masses and that cum-covered rag who actually wears a t-shirt to your dishwasher job interview. <laughs> All joke aside, it didn't dawn on me till years later. But all the bullshit, all the unwanted Marine Corps workout regimes, the lightweights, bizarre punishments, walking each one of the dogs, there were four, three times a day in Arctic conditions, followed by bathing each dog after each walk to get the salt off of their fur. Spending eight straight hours shoveling neighbors' driveways for free in five feet of snow, on a Saturday while other kids were playing Nintendo and drinking hot chocolate. Being forced to carry three half the garbage bags full of beer bottles. Half of them jagged, piercing the bag, open for two miles, while Dick had yuppies beat them. Then having to run back for another bag in negative 20 degrees weather. Being told to get back up after getting nailed in the face with a 70 to 80 mile an hour fastball, the man played minor league. Well, it was all kind of nuts and borders on child abuse. <laughs> and I sure as hell won't raise my kids that way. But I like to imagine it like Kill Bill. And I'm Uma Thurman. <laughs> and he's the intense shaman dude. All of that stuff did make me tough. It gave me a thick skin. It gave me the balls you need to get through constant rejection, falling on your face, and bottomless pits of failure so that I could get to where I am. And hey, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not great at being a mature adult. I don't own a castle. But all that aside, Tom Evans, I thank you for the gravel in my guts and the spit in my eye. Life is pretty good for a boy named Sue. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, clear it up, finally. 
<laughs> Who are your musical influences? Uh, musical influences. Uh, the Swans, uh, the Birthday Party, and the Girls, of course. Um, no. I uh, seriously, I like a lot of stuff that people like. Like, like I like a lot of Louis Fair shit, man. Like, um, I was really into Ten Thousand Maniacs growing up. Another thing I stuck with. So good, man. Like songs from The Big Chair, um, uh, Blind Man Zoo, and like, man, it's so good, man. I'm hard <coughs> out. Well, yeah, our time to eat yeah, man. Um, you know, a lot like REM, uh, the Cocky Two Twins. I was so nervous saying that because Cock is in the name. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's another thing, when I first moved to Baltimore, um, for some reason I was self-conscious about people thinking I was gay. Um, I had these masculinity issues, and I re yeah, it, it, that's, uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but I would constantly, if you remember this, when I first moved to Baltimore, I'd be like, hey, I'm gay, I'm gay, just kidding. Like, <laughs> I think what it was was that like, I've always been, I've never been like that macho dude, and I've always felt self-conscious about it. Like, I've had people like my stepdad around me, and my friends were like football players and cops and shit. So, no, not all of them are cops, just like one of them. So, so we weird group of friends. And I don't know, I'm the most macho dude I know. Um, so I, I think I've always been self-conscious, I'm like, oh, I'm not like those guys, I don't fit in, so I'm just like... So I think that that was this weird thing that I was doing, and then years later I realized that, like, to be confused with David Bowie, or um, one of the guys that had that show where they dressed people up, would be a compliment of the house, house for Bowie. Um, Oh yeah, this is how you do another one. Hey. How did you uh, discover or evolve your singing voice, or your screaming voice? The screaming voice? Um, it's a little Kathleen Hanna. It's a little Gilbert Godfrey. Uh, it's a little old Kathleen Hanna, a little Gilbert Godfrey. Um, it's, uh, you know what it was? I was doing this thing, there was this, uh, I think it was Vanessa Beecroft, she's this artist. And I read an interview that she did, and she talked about this thing where she would go out with a tape recorder, just press record, and just like, just whatever weird, insane shit comes to mind, just scream it. So I had to go walk to get my fifth learner's permit, um, I, you know, five of them, which also expired. I'm walking around with the passport right now. And um, I was like, I walked by a gas station, and I was just like, I'm like, oh, like, that's weird. And then I, I, I showed it to some of the YMC people, like, this is cool. And I'm like, you're insane. But, 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 but uh, I think it also comes from, I'm a big fan of like, Steve Albini, like Big Black, and he kind of does that falsetto, and, like, and Bowie kind of does it too. I think it's also just like, I wanted to do something that was very animalistic and cathartic and performance arty, and I think that that was a way to kind of get things out um, because, you know, I know that I'm just going to end up becoming a loud singer, because that's the stuff like, I love, oh, I love doing that air show kind of bullshit. But, you know, I'm like, oh, man, but you got to have that animal part, like, you know, well, I was also listening to White House a lot, and White House, yeah, White House is great, it's fine over there. Good stuff, their ethos are strange, they're all art teachers, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of how that came about. I started, uh, I started out playing a metal CD rack when I got to Baltimore with contact mics, but people thought that was really pretentious. And I would play with scissors, and then I'd cut my hands, and the contact mic would fall off and way through the set. Didn't go too good. <laughs> yeah, but then it evolved with a drum. I toured with Teeth Mountain one night, I left the drum out, and started playing that, and then I met a bassist. <laughs> um, it's good, good guy, good guy. We don't sit today. Um, okay, if you did, no, no, we'll sit next to each other on tour. It's okay. Um, what's up? Uh, so you talk a lot, right? but you also do all this other stuff, like music. The yeah. dynamics of the show. What would you say? How do you perceive the relationship of all the shit you're saying and all the stuff you're doing? Because you you do a lot and you say a lot. Uh, so how, you know, what's the relationship with that? And how do you perceive the two different things? I think you kind of you, know, you talk a lot and you do a lot, but you don't mention that you do both things. Yeah, I think that I have to have a. <laughs> I think that I have to have a separation, I think I have to compartmentalize things because, you know, it's, um, I mean, even as, as early as the age of like about uh, six or seven, I would make these tape recordings and it would be like, uh, you know, different people talking to each other and I would kind of act out stuff that happened in school and I would play the teacher's voices and stuff like that. And I think I've always been one to want to escape. I think it's a form of escapism, you know? It's like, 
I guess, you know, when you're from upstate New York and it's like minus 20 and it's desolate and like a suicide rate's like 90% of the population, <laughs> it's like living in NORAD or something, you <laughs> kind of have to have this form of escape, and I think everybody has that. With some people, it's playing Halo. With some people, it's like, you know, going to poetry nights. With some people, it's like uh, getting, getting involved in a pasta cooking contest. Two <laughs> minutes. At one. No, for sure. Russell would he, he, he'd say yes. Um, I think that I think that in the beginning, what it was was like the voices. This makes me sound like an insane person, but the voices, the voices. I think all the different personas and uh, the different like activities and voices were just different conduits for me to constantly shift gears so I didn't have to fo focus on what I wasn't comfortable about in, uh, growing up when I was a kid. I was uncomfortable about myself in a lot of ways. I was very self-conscious. I got messed with a lot at school and, you know, and just, you know, I got, I got beat up a lot. I got messed with, um, I was wearing hand-me-down clothes. I'd have shoes with holes in them. Smell weird. I still do. Um, yeah. Went to school then. Um, you know, I, I, was a, I was a weird kid. I was trying to, who's that kid in the Simpsons that's really weird? Like a text like this? You know, that really weird. Wow. Rough. I was like rough, you know? And I was really self-conscious about that, you know, and like, um, there was even a point, I talked about this in the comedy routine once, where my stepdad had me going door to door with like this fake log with like weeds glued on it to sell for money. And like, you know, this is how people saw me in the community. So I needed to escape, and I think I made all those different conduits and characters and people to escape as like this kind of coping mechanism at the time to kind of, you know, get through the rough stuff. And, but it was so much fun that I just didn't stop and then it evolved and turned into all these other things and now it's like a semi-job, regular sports thing, $20 every two weeks. But you know, like, you know, doing music, making $300 a month doing music, um, and you know, doing a podcast and stuff like that. You know, I think it's, it's like anybody, like some people, you know, watch Netflix or eat cookies. You know, my escape, I do that too, actually. <laughs> But for me, I think that's my drug, my form of escape, is uh, the catharsis of those characters. Um, come on, oh, this is fun. <laughs> yes? I think I've asked this of you before, but will you describe the birthday present your stepdad gave you that one time? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, he gave me, like last year, he gave me a Mickey Mouse Club DVD. Not that one. Okay, oh, okay. The, the gift you're talking about. One year he gave me um, a, a wooden pencil holder and had like two layers to it and like two brass things that held at the top and the bottom there with pennies glued to it. <laughs> and he glued the pen. Is this the one you're talking about? I thought it was a change machine. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no, yeah. It was okay. It was a change machine, but um, he glued all the coins inside the change machine so you could never use it, deeming it useless. And then. He wrapped this completely worthless gift with my most expensive baseball cards and then covered it in saran wrap. And then he, but this was not, there was no other intent, he's just insane. And so it was almost like the most beautiful gift. <laughs> Hit me, man. Yes, what's up? Uh, uh, how do you think Russia will perceive you? Um, I don't know, man. I think, uh, how would Rush Limbaugh perceive me? Let's hear it. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and traitors of America. I have a ginger tabby named Filibuster. I respect the organization. Um, I think... I, I think that there's two sides of Rush Limbaugh. I think what he does on the air is not totally him. I think he's just like this scared, weird, sad little person in real life that's just kind of like weird and probably has like a toe fetish or something. And I think that we get along on that, uh, on that platform. <laughs> Next question. I don't have to follow this. Yes. When, this one, I get the fuck out of that one, man. <laughs> when normal people ask you what you do, normal what do people. you say? There's no normal people. What do I say? Well, no, no, I mean, you know, it's like, I, I think everybody has a propensity to be just as weird or just as normal as anybody. You know but, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You should be a professor, that's it. That is a future professor, thank you. All right, hi. Um, uh, no, I just said, uh, um, I play bass, no, 
I play, no, I don't. I play, I play drums in the band that kind of sounds like the Talking Heads, you know, just like Phil Collins, but I don't make as much money. That's, that's my elevator speech, you know. Um, but yeah, usually it's just like, oh, you guys are talking to music, what do you do? My son likes, um, my son likes Paul Love, you know, right? this that. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. I'm like, yeah. I just, you know, that's what I tell him, yeah. Um, um, if I talk about the comedy, I'll just be like, Hey, you, you like, if you like Bill Cosby, if you like, if you like Mark Twain, come on in. If you like Barbies, if you like Hourglass, no. Um, anyway, keep, keep, this is fun, this is fun. Shoot me down, man. Yeah. Yes? Do you think Jazz Mind has any crossover appeal? Uh, Jazz Mind? Yeah. It's funny, man, that you say that because, uh, there's, uh, I got a Twitter from, like, like, London Jazz 105 is not following you. And when I realized it's like a jazz station in London, that obviously didn't do the research and thought that uh, <laughs> Jazz Mind was a, an actual jazz album. And then they unfollowed me. So <laughs> I think they must have gotten the demo. Well, I mean, you know, they're playing Miles Davis and stuff. And like, I'm like, the next Miles Davis, so they're not ready for it. No, I, I don't do jazz music, so that's not, that's not a joke. It's, it's, it's OK. Um, but yeah, uh, crossover. You mean like uh, with like pop music or with like? Well, mass appeal because like every song on it is catchy. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm, it's funny. My niece and nephew actually dig it, and they're five years old. There's a, a video. So I mean, if, I think that that's a canary in the coal mine, and I think you know, maybe ah. it's a mess. I mean, like the Proclaimers sounded pretty fucking weird the first time we heard them, but we all grew to love them. It became part of the vernacular in the mainstream. Look up Proclaimers when you get home, you will laugh your ass off at that last joke. Um, my niece and nephew, uh, who are like five years old, uh, did a rendition of the song Rats, and, and my niece, so cute, she has like, the same hair as Devlin. So when she has glasses that look like Devlin's glasses, and my nephew who is just like me, and I have a twin sister, so it's kind of weird. They're playing the song Rats, and then she's singing Rats Coming Out of Me. And, then, and the lyrics are actually uh, Rats Coming Over Me, uh, which is kind of like a, a reference to this like Tori in this video where she has like, rats crawling over her. And in the interview she explains that it's like this religious metaphor. Uh, in some certain religions, uh, rats crawling on you is like speaking in tongues to God and stuff like that. Trying to get all deep. But she's talking about rats coming out of the carcass, and when she's five, she already rules. <laughs> and, then my, and then my nephew David is like playing, playing the toy drum, and it's just amazing. So yeah, if they did it, I think they, you know. But then again, they're probably not normal because they're related to me. So, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think it could have some appeal. It's just, you know, verse, 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 you know, and just, I, I mean, I grew up, you know, the first album I ever bought was the La Bamba soundtrack, you know. And then I think it was followed by Huey Lewis and the News. So, I mean, I was, I, I was raised on pop music, you know, so I guess that, it's in it's in there. It's in there. And all this guys have a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I just want to follow that up by saying uh, it's really exciting for me to listen to Ed uh, speak about that because we come from the same area. So he mentioned WRVO Playhouse, and I'm the only one here that knows that Ed just perceives himself as, uh, as uh, that Krauss character there that runs WRVO Playhouse. And none of you know who that is. <laughs> So that's a secret thing that Ed and I can do. <laughs> but um, so that that is the conclusion of this installment of the Wem City Lecture Series. Uh, Wem City Lecture Series will return to you on the 26th of this month with um, Patrick Barron, who's going to be talking about food labels uh, and the insidious lies that are being told to you in your supermarkets every day. Um, which promises to be a real uh, eye-bulging and uh, insane experience. And then Alex Gilbert, who has recently left us for the insidious New York, will come back to talk about science fiction, uh, which I fucking love. Um, uh, I know, I, well, Issa is going to be teaching about empathy and performance at the free school. You said you have a show coming up also. When's that? 
Saturday. This Saturday. Two to four. Two to four. Kimbo Dance Festival. At the Kimbo, oh, it'll be a Kimbo Dance Festival, which I just signed up to come to on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, is, is there any other events that are happening? There's a show at the Golden happening? West tonight. Was that? There's a show at the Golden West. There's a show at the Golden West, which you should just immediately rush to <laughs> right after this to the Golden West one up in beautiful Hamden. Uh, 